the stone won't fall until the podcast of the dragon comes to your device. Hey everybody, my name is Morgan. You might know me as the Grey Warder on Twitter and Discord. Welcome to the 13th episode of Podcast of the Dragon. Are you relieved that Joe Biden won the election? Holy shit, so am I. Wait, wrong notes. Today we're going to pivot from our sheep burger and head to the White Tower to hang out with some young ladies who spend way too much time talking about him. I'll do a bit of character study, talk about their relationships, and discuss some of my hopes for the upcoming show. One of the things that makes The Great Hunt such a terrific book is the fact that Robert Jordan is able to begin to spread the story out and make use of this giant world that he has. He's able to take us into different countries and show us different cultures, introduce us to politics, introduce us to war, introduce us to other characters with point of views that show us a very unto rivers way of looking at things, which is a quick and very effective way to impart a ton of knowledge upon the reader, even if much of it is merely like flavor and impression rather than factual tidbits. He introduces us to characters who teach us things and aid in world building based solely on the POV character's perception of them. We see so many things that were not part of the narrative throughout the first book when it was very much focused on an immediate goal of we're being chased and we're trying to get to this destination of safety. The majority of the Great Hunt is fixated on Rand. In the Watt Wiki, they have a statistical breakdown of point of view and word count of individual books of the entire series, and Rand has 53% of the word count in the second book. Egwene, with 13.5% roughly of the word count, comes in a far second. So the book is very much focused on Rand, his journey, his struggles, and I've been concentrating most of my Great Hunt podcast episodes on him or things dealing with him, partly because there's just a lot to talk about with him and his story, and also just because this really is my favorite book when it comes to Rand. RJ is really trying to show us as much as he can without bogging the story down, but the main tale is following the horn and seeing Rand struggle and getting everybody to tome and head. And so most of the action follows the main character because Rand is the one who is in the really shitty situation. And Jordan just shows us the other bits of the story where and as he can. And so when it comes to the Aes Sedai, he introduces us to them completely outside of their environment because that's most convenient for the story. When they all come to Faldara, we first encounter the Aes Sedai as a whole, the entity outside of just the single one that we know in Moraine, and we meet them in a completely different environment from their native habitat, which gives us an interesting bit of world building, learning who they are while they're separated from their home base, and that's kind of a cool way to present them because it skews perceptions learning about or trying to learn about someone and their culture, even though they don't live in their native land. Like, they can tell you things, you can deduce things from their speech and their behavior, but you're not seeing them immersed in their actual environment. You know, seeing an American existing in a European country, for example, is much different than seeing an American in the United States. At least I'm assuming. I've heard that American expats try to really tone down their Americanness because, you know, we want to look as little like assholes as we possibly can. If I ever manage to flee America, I'm hoping someday, I expect that my wife and I will be very toned down and you would not be able to learn much about American culture and get the best idea of what Americanness or being an American is not actually seeing me in the United States, though I might not be the best example anyway because I'm kind of weird. But that is much the same as learning about Aes Sedai in Faldara. You do get an interesting impression seeing them there, but you don't really see them in their home. And RJ doesn't seem to be interested in showing us much of that, certainly not this early in the series. He wants to show us the White Tower, and we do get to see it, but he is not really interested in showing us much of the Magic Academy aspects of the White Tower. 
What goes down among the full Aes Sedai is what interests him. He wants to explore the politics. He wants to introduce the significant secondary and tertiary characters, like the individual Aes Sedai. He likes that. He's interested in the subplots that we get later on. So really, RJ doesn't care to show us very much of the White Tower until it starts to break apart. Even in Book 3, the girls return to the Tower, and he tries to spend as little time there as possible and get them out ASAP. Once we get to where it's leading up to the coup, getting into book four, we start to see more. We're getting POVs from Swan Sanche and starting to see inner narratives from Elida, who is trying to figure out what Swan is up to. But post Elida's coup is when Jordan really explores the White Tower, because I don't think the White Tower is particularly interesting to him, at least until it's broken and he can begin to explore the subplots and the people therein. So, in The Great Hunt, we honestly don't see very much of Tarvalon, and we get really only four-ish chapters inside the White Tower. Four to five. We get a chapter where they're going down the river, and then they arrive in Tarvalon. Then it cuts to Rand stealing the horn, and then heading into Tremotian, looking at the male Chodon call, giving himself just a giant fucking headache, everything that I broke down in the last episode. And then... It goes back to Tar Valen and we get Nynaeve's accepted test, the chapter that covers that, and we're told that a few days have passed since they've arrived in Tar Valen. So we get a bit of a timeline, and we can presume Rand traveled to the city of Kyrian with Tavalin and all of the soldiers during that time. We get the chapter called New Friends and Old Enemies, where Egwene meets Elaine, and they talk to Min, and you get reintroduced to Gawain and Galad and Elida. And then 13 weeks go by, where the interlude is everything that happens with Rand and Kyrian, and then Rand takes the portal stone to Tome and Head, and the next thing you know, we're back in the White Tower. That time has passed. Rand and the others are still out of the world, and you get Elaine coming in and saying, Oh, King Galdrian has died. It's a war of succession. And there's a bit of inner narrative from Egwene where she's thinking about Rand, and that it almost feels like he ceased to exist a few weeks after she reached the tower. So RJ is kind of like getting all of his pieces together. So he brings Egwene and Nynaeve to the tower for training, and has them meet up with Min and Elaine. But what goes on as far as like they're studying and stuff, he must not have found it very interesting, and so we don't see much of it. We get a tiny bit of description of Tarvalon as they arrive. Egwene and Nynaeve get off the boat, and it says, Nynaeve stalked off the ship with grim determination on her face, but Egwene made her way dejectedly down the gangplank and through the tarry smell that hung over the wharf. All that talk about wanting us here, and now they don't seem to care. Broad stairs led up from the dock to a wide arch of dark redstone. On reaching it, Egwene and Nynaeve stopped to stare. Every building seemed a palace, though most of those close to the arch seemed to contain inns or shops from the signs over the doors. Fanciful stonework was everywhere, and the lines of one structure seemed designed to complement and set off the next, leading the eye along as if everything were part of one vast design. Some structures did not look like buildings at all, but like gigantic waves breaking or huge shells or fanciful wind-sculpted cliffs. Right in front of the arch lay a broad square with a fountain and trees, and Egwene could see another square further on. Above everything rose the towers, tall and graceful, some with sweeping bridges between them high in the sky, and over all rose one tower, higher and wider than all the rest, as wide as the shining walls themselves." And that's really the only description that we get of Tarvalon beyond the tiniest little bit as they're leaving the tower and going to the Ogier Grove to meet with Leandrin to take the ways to Tome and Head where she fucks them over and gives them to the Shanchen. We also see very little of initiate life. RJ sketches it with a few scenes. We see Nynaeve's test for accepted, and that actually does a bunch of important world building mixed in with the exciting gauntlet that is the actual test. We get a view of this cavernous chamber beneath the White Tower, which helps kind of build this impression of the tower itself. 
is like a monolith. It's it's really kind of impressive. We see our first Tyrangriel, and we get an idea of the level of endurance and dedication that is required as Shirim is kind of breaking it down for Nynaeve. Basically, we put you through this ringer because we've got to know that you really, really want it. We will not accept less. And the cool thing about showing us Nynaeve's test first we're shown it before we see anything else of the internal structure of the White Tower, building or institution, before we see a novice room or get a rundown of what training is like or anything. The cool thing about seeing the accepted test and how brutal it is and hearing Shiriam's warning, you know, you can fucking go into this Tarangriel and never come out, and if you fuck up and you falter or fail, and if you refuse to, if you refuse to go through once you've started, we will kick you out. It tells the first-time reader that this is not Hogwarts. It's more like the Naval Academy if the midshipmen were all walking ordnance. So, the White Tower is technically a magic school, but it's really a military academy. And it's the type of military academy that is also a political hub. And I picked the Naval Academy specifically, not because I said I remind me of sailors, but because if you look at any of the U.S. service academies... The Air Force Academy is in Colorado. The United States Military Academy at West Point is up in New York. The Coast Guard Academy is in Connecticut. The Naval Academy in Annapolis is minutes away from Washington, D.C. So while it is a school, jobs outside of academia exist there, and that close to D.C. allows it to be a political hub for ambitious officers in a way that other service academies just can't be. And so I feel that of all of the U.S. service academies, it is the one most comparable to what the White Tower would be. Despite having a training academy to send the girls to, R.J. didn't want them there. He doesn't want them in the tower. He wants them there as little as possible. He wants them out in the world and in danger like the boys. So despite having a structure or an organization to belong to that helps them navigate the ins and outs of their powers, rather than, you know, being in school and learning and earning their commission that way, he wants them out earning field commissions, out in the mud getting dirty, being in danger, rather than in a classroom doing the hard work, the, the book work, and all the learning that prepares someone in an intellectual way and gives them the broad knowledge base to draw on as well as an understanding of the system. But the world is ending. Nobody's got time for that. And RJ wants the girls out learning the hard way. And so they spend almost no time in the tower. And so we get very little of initiate life. We get just a few scenes. We get the test for accepted. And we get a scene between Egwene and another accepted, which gives us an idea of the general kind of culture of novices and accepted and how they relate to each other. It says, Egwene followed the accepted through the halls of the White Tower. Tapestries and paintings covered walls as white as the outside of the tower. Patterned tiles made the floor. The acceptance white dress was exactly like hers, except for seven narrow bands of color at hem and cuffs. Egwene frowned, looking at that dress. Since yesterday, Nynaeve had worn an acceptance dress, and she seemed to have no joy of it, nor of the golden ring, a serpent eating its own tail that marked her level. The few times Egwene had been able to see the wisdom, Nynaeve's eyes had seemed shadowed, as if she had seen things she wished with all her heart not to have seen. In here, the accepted said curtly, gesturing to a door. Named Pedra, she was a short, wiry woman, a little older than Nynaeve, and with a briskness always in her voice. You're given this time because it is your first day, but I'll expect you in the scullery when the gong sounds high and not one moment later. Egwene curtsied, then stuck out her tongue at the accepted's retreating back. It might have been only the evening before that Shiriam had finally put her name in the novice book, but already she knew she did not like Pedra. She pushed open the door and went in. The room was plain and small, with white walls, and there was a young woman with reddish-gold hair spilling around her shoulders, sitting on one of two hard benches. The floor was bare. Novices did not get much use of rooms with carpets. So that's not much, but it does give us a bit of description to let us know things are stark, People have hard benches and no carpets. Everybody wears white. The accepted can be kind of dicks and really find novices to be a drag. We see no lessons. In literally one and a half paragraphs, Jordan sketches novice life. It says, Egwene took the other bench, facing Elaine. 
I thought the Aes Sedai would teach me now that I'm finally a novice, but all that's happened so far is that Pedro woke me a good two hours before first light and put me to sweeping the halls. She says I have to help wash dishes after dinner, too. Elaine grimaced. I hate washing dishes. I never had to. Well, that doesn't matter. You will have training. From now on, you will be at training at this hour every day, as a matter of fact, from breakfast until high, then again from dinner to trine. If you are especially quick or especially slow, they may take you from supper to full as well, but that is usually for more chores. And that's basically everything that you know about the training. You learn more about the lessons that they get on the journey from Faldara to Tarvalin. There we actually see some training. Other than that, that's it. And then from there, RJ pivots to what he actually wants to show us, which is the relationships between the four girls and the character development and the reintroduction of characters, because he's planning on getting them out of the tower as fast as he can. This chapter where Egwene meets Elaine for the first time, it's called New Friends and Old Enemies. It has a lot that I struggle with. Because along with reintroducing us to Min, Galad, Gowan, Elida, and Elaine, there's a lot of really cringy dialogue surrounding Rand. Like, really cringy dialogue. And it's like, a little bit of it, it's fine. Elaine asks after Rand, and Egwene feels a little jealous because she's really pretty, you know? Okay, fine. But once you start getting into the... We're all going to be friends, and we're not going to let a man get in the way of that, not even him, because Min has had this vision that Rand's going to have three women, and she knows that one of those women isn't going to be Egwene, and so when Elaine tells Min that Egwene likes Rand, because Egwene ducks Min's question of, hey, how's Rand doing, and it's just, Rand, 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 and it's... Uh... I cannot express how excited I am for the show to do this better. And... It's one of the great things about the Wheel of Time in a weird way. The fact that there are just some things that RJ does not do well means that there are things the show can improve on. So even if they don't do everything well or as well as the books or in a way that completely satisfies the fan base, there are things about this terrific series that are lackluster that the show can make beautiful. And in doing so, they can bring like a whole new life or a whole new dimension to the Wheel of Time. And having the opportunity, especially with a modern lens, to explore love interests or romantic relationships and do it well, because there's just so much that I dislike about this. Rekapa Sedai, if you've never watched Wheel Talk with Rekapa Sedai, you must. It's amazing. You will laugh your ass off. She calls them the timeshare ladies, because the idea of them being Rand's harem is offensive. And I know she got that from someone else, whoever she got it from. I'm sorry that I don't know who you are, so I can give you credit. There's so much that I dislike about the timeshare ladies thing. The fact that both Min and Avienda have visions about their future relationship with Rand. I hate that. There's so much lack of agency involved in that. It's like, oh... I see this man, and I'm going to fall in love with him, even though I don't want to. And Min understands her visions enough to know, oh, well, I don't have any choice about it, so I'm going to roll with it. And kind of, she makes fun of it and whatever. And when she sees that Elaine is going to be one of the women, she's like, okay. And she develops a friendship with Elaine, kind of being proactive and making the best of it, but still just a prisoner to her vision. And Avienda goes through a Tyrangriel and actually sees a future scenario where she's going to bone down with Rand in a sex igloo. And so she is angry and she runs from that vision because for her, that's an offense against her honor. Rand is already with Elaine and she's like, yeah, I'm not going to bone down with somebody who's already with someone else unless we've actually sat down and talked about it because the Aiel are all about ethical non-monogamy. I've said before that I don't think Jordan really wanted to write relationships, but that they were expected, and, you know, that's just how it was back in the 90s. Reading a book like this and having any of the main characters remain single, it just would not have felt complete. You would have been wondering, you know, why is so-and-so getting hosed? Especially because they come from such a conservative background, making these people face danger, and particularly possibly life-ending danger, because Rand's fate is spelled out, like, yo, you're gonna die. 
dying a virgin that just seems like the cruelest fate ever in western society it's kind of like the most horrid or cruel joke on anyone who must go out and face danger or war like don't let me die a virgin so it's almost like he wrote these awkward romances just so people don't have to face death without having at least been laid once and that's not a good enough reason and he executes them so clumsily that it almost feels purposeful and it's not necessary, like, it is not necessary to have men tell us, oh, Rand and Egwene aren't made for each other, she's not for you and you're not for her, not in the way you both want. RJ already laid the foundation for Rand and Egwene not to be together. You don't need anything else beyond that. They were both feeling ambivalent regarding marriage. Once Rand came adventuring, however unwillingly, for Egwene, he seemed more like husband material at that point, because it's like she's out in the world doing what she wanted to do, which was getting away and having more for herself, and he's coming along. But in his eyes, the fact that she was going to become an Aes Sedai, immediately that was a massive boner killer for him, you know. Even before she knew that he could channel, he was not interested in going to Tarvalon with her. Like, when they were in the Blight on the way to the Eye of the World, and she's like, oh, will you come to Tarvalon too? And he's just kind of like, there's nothing for me to do there. You know, and just trying to kind of give her a non-answer. Because for him, her being an Aes Sedai is a deal-breaker. And it really came across like it was a deal-breaker, even before he knew that he could channel. And then afterwards, it was absolutely a deal-breaker for him. And when she was like, you know, I know, I'll make you my warder. You'd like being my warder. He said that he wanted to be her warder because he knew that she needed to hear that answer. But did he really want to be her warder? Would he ever had the fuckery of him having been the dragon and being able to channel and everything? If that had not been a thing, if Rand's whole purpose was no greater than, say, Gowan's purpose... Would he really have been interested in just going to Tarvalon and training with warders and being a Gwaine's warder? Because I just don't see him being able to do that. He does not trust Aes Sedai, and it makes him too uncomfortable. The idea of a Gwaine being an Aes Sedai makes him uncomfortable. And as much as he loves her as a friend and loves her as a person, it's a deal breaker. And obviously it's not a deal breaker later on with Elaine, but that's different. It's different with someone that you come to know later, when that's already part of the game. Once Egwene knows that Rand can channel any dream she might have had of, hey, maybe we can get married since we're out in the world together, that dream is gone. And it's not that it's gone out of prejudice exactly, like, ew, you can channel, never mind. It's just, it's gone because she's a realist. She knows that he's not going to be safe. She knows that he'll go insane and die. She knows the fate of a man who can channel. She lives in reality, which is one of the things that makes me love Egwene so much. She does not fight with how she does not want things to be. Or like, you know, it shouldn't be like that. Or I refuse to accept that. She's very much like, well, this is how it is. She knows the reality of what it is for a man who can channel. And she knows that his channeling means that he is not marriageable material. And it's sort of like it might be different if she were in a position where she could marry him right now. Egwene may be practical, but she is still a romantic, and I can totally see her marrying a terminally ill lover so that they can have what happiness they can find before he dies. But by the time she gets to the point where she will be able to marry, at least from the knowledge that she has where she is at in the Great Hunt, she doesn't know where she is there that in two years' time she's going to be leading the armies of the light and be the Amberlin seat, and she'll be married, you know, married to Gowan, but married. So for her, the future that she sees for herself, marriage is a long way off because she's got a lot of training to do. And by the time she is in a place where she could get married, Rand will be insane or dead. Rand's future and her future are not futures that can coincide. And she feels flashes of jealousy when Elaine asks after Rand because she hasn't totally resigned to herself yet. But it's only been about six weeks. So she's still struggling. She's struggling with all of her ambivalent feelings about Rand. You know, it's hard to have known most of your life that, hey, you're going to marry this dude, only to have fought with him about your guys' ideas of what your marriage was going to be and then wondered whether it even was going to be. 
and then having to leave the two rivers and feeling almost hopeful because you guys were going together and then just having everything go to shit. And she still feels like he's hers, but that he's being cruelly taken away. Because her reality is such that it's just not a thing that can be, because he won't be Rand. And that's the truth. The reason that Elaine or Min can be with him and not mind so much is that they don't know him as well. And so the changes that he goes through over the next year or two are not alarming in a way that they alarm Egwene. Within the next year, as she is going through the Aiel Waste with Rand and seeing how rapidly he changes as he's starting to have issues with his sanity and she becomes more and more alarmed at how different he is, you know, that's scary and disturbing and it's just not as noticeable for people who don't know him as well. People like Elaine and Min can take him as he is as a channeler because it's not troubling in the way it is for Egwene who knows the person that he used to be. And I don't think that that's prejudiced. I think it's logical. I really like Rand and Egwene's relationship. The fact that it's doomed from the very beginning and they go on to have these character arcs that mirror each other, it's so refreshing. It's kind of like you would never have expected when it starts out that these two people having what seemed like they were boyfriend and girlfriend having it go, oh, this isn't going to work out, it fizzles out, and instead of having their arc become one of them almost being like celestial twins, it's so interesting. There's nothing forced or phony about what's between Rand and Egwene. It's a real relationship between two people who aren't really right for each other and are prone to butt heads. They really care about each other, but it's just, it's not meant to be. And deep down, they know that it's for the best, and it's really nice. I think that it's a great relationship. I hate Min's vision about three women loving Rand with a fiery passion. And this cringy scene in the Tower Garden where Elaine takes Egwene to meet Min, and Min's on the bridge over the stream that runs through the garden, and Galad and Gowan show up, and everybody just talks about Rand. It's so cringy. It's so cringy that I'm lazily narrating it to you rather than reading you a quote because I just can't make myself read it. When it comes to the timeshare ladies, if you break it down and ask people which one they like best with Rand, people tend to prefer men. And obviously that's not hard data, but from casual surveys that I have seen and done, men seems to be the runaway favorite. And I just, I don't. You know, she's got a lot going for her, and her personal arc through books four and five, they're, it's quite enjoyable. Like, I really enjoy her time when she comes back to the White Tower and where she rescues Swan and Liana, but she just, she too often doesn't have agency, and her visions really irritate me because they so often seem to rob her of that. And while I definitely don't subscribe to the idea that she's a sexy lamp exactly, her being tied to Rand to the exclusion of so much else is really disappointing. And as far as Avienda's relationship with Rand, I'm just kind of meh with that. I mean, they have plenty of time together for her to start to really develop feelings for him, but her constant lashing out at him is just... I find that kind of behavior exhausting. Avienda is not one of my favorite characters. She is too often letting loose with her temper, and admittedly she generally just uncorks it on Rand, but he doesn't deserve it, and he shouldn't have to put up with it, and I just, I don't have a lot of patience with people who don't take responsibility for their emotions, and so characters who are like that don't endear themselves to me. So if I have a favorite as far as the women in Rand's life, I prefer Elaine. And I know that Elaine really annoys people as far as her feelings for Rand, particularly this early when she's just talking about him all the time and she's only met him once. But I can understand her fixated crush on him. He is very different from any of the other boys that she's ever met and he made an impression on her. When I was in eighth grade, this boy came from Colorado and he was just very different from all of the other boys in school. He dressed very differently, you know, he had his head partially shaved. He was so 
different from the kind of button-down boys, and I had an instantaneous hardcore crush on him, and I talked about him all the time at home, and I struggled not to talk about him to people at school because I didn't want it to be obvious that I had a crush on him. I had spoken to this kid maybe once, and I had such a crush on him, and it was almost like I adored the idea of him, of someone who was so utterly novel and unlike any boy that I had ever known. So I get it. I get being fixated on someone who's unusual and interesting. And while Rand in the normal scheme of things is not a particularly interesting person, at least certainly not early on, from Elaine's point of reference, he is kind of interesting, particularly given the situation in which he more or less falls into her lap. Well, he fell into her garden. And if you go back and look at the scene where he falls into the garden, there's actually a lot there that's emotionally impactful. He fell in because she startled him, and at that point, she is the type of person to feel bad and responsible. She would never have meant for that to happen. So she goes into caregiver mode, and she tends to him. She's trying to treat his wounds and offer him a sense of protection, make him feel safe when he's obviously upset and agitated and hurt. But she doesn't want him to go out the same way that he came in, clamber back over the wall, and I think part of that is just because he's interesting and she doesn't want to let him go yet. And so in doing that, she ends up putting him in danger because fucking Galad shows up and he's like, hey, he's dangerous. And she's like, fuck off out of my presence, yo. And Galad leaves and he goes and gets the guards. So at that point, Elaine, not letting Rand leave when he wanted to, put him in serious danger. And Elaine feels this tremendous sense of responsibility for him and a need to protect him to the point where she basically throws herself on her knees at her mother's mercy, begging her not to harm Rand. She's like, he would have left right away if I hadn't stopped him. You know, and basically feeling like if anything bad happened to him, it would be all her fault because she felt a momentary sense of selfishness. You know, don't climb over the wall and scratch yourself up again after I did all this to help you out. Never thinking about how this poor kid who fell into the garden feels when he's like, I need to leave, I need to leave, I need to leave, I'm panicking. So I can see that whole experience being very impactful and having a strong impression on her. And it's believable. There is realism to the foundation of Elaine's feelings, you know. I fell in love with my wife because her grandmother died while she was at work. And my boss told me to please bring her her coat and her bag and check up on her while she waited for her ride. And I went and I brought her her stuff and I sat quietly with her in the little first aid office that we have, very irritated with my boss for making me do it because it was awkward and uncomfortable and I was afraid I was going to say something insensitive and upset my wife-to-be. But in so doing, we had a special moment. And those kinds of things happen, and it's real in a way that I had a vision that I would love you and have to share you with people, or I went through a magical artifact and it showed me this future where I would be with you, even though it's a violation of my honor, because I said I would watch you for someone else, and I definitely did not talk to her ahead of time about getting all up on your dick, and so that is not ethical non-monogamy, and I am pissed about it. Those just aren't real." And so I like Elaine's relationship best of all of them. That's not to say I think Robert Jordan writes it very well. I don't think he writes any of the romantic relationships particularly well. And so I am excited for the show because it has the opportunity to make it so much better. And originally I was hoping for them to do a complicated poly quad where it would start out with Min and Elaine together when Nynaeve and Egwene first come to the tower. And Elaine and Avienda get together later. And so there's just this relationship structure of a polyquad where Elaine and Rand are romantically involved with all three other partners, but Avienda and Min aren't involved with each other because there's no chemistry there. Because that's a realistic representation of a type of polyquad. There are all different kinds of ways to practice polyamory, whether you're thruples or quads or whatever. And there are plenty of quads where not all partners are partnered with every other partner. And so since Avienda and Min never really get a lot of time together, and they never even really become friends exactly, Avienda feels she has toe to Min because Min helps her get to the point where she declares herself a wise one, but they never have 
chemistry. And so the idea of having a poly quad where it's like Elaine bones down with Rand, Min, and Avienda, Rand bones down with Elaine, Min, and Avienda, Avienda bones down with Elaine and Rand, Min bones down with Elaine and Rand, and Avi and Min are friendly. That's complicated, but it has the flavor of realism as well, because a quad where everybody is into everybody isn't common. But having spent more time contemplating the dynamics of a show and relationships in general, now I want something simpler. Because thinking about Min, I really want her character to have more. I don't like how much of her character is wrapped around Rand. I want her to be tied to Rand for her ability and have any relationship between them be irrelevant and unpredetermined. So what I would like to see is that she has a vision that she is tied to Rand in the sense that he needs her abilities, and I want one of her visions to be that he will found two bloodlines. And then they need to find some other way to build a relationship between Elaine and Avienda besides anything to do with Rand. I want Rand to be irrelevant to Elaine and Avienda's relationship. Maybe they could fall for each other in the Stone of Tear, maybe something else. Who knows? Because I don't feel that the relationship between Elaine and Avienda in the books actually comes off as romantic. People are like, oh, they're together and that's canon. And I'm like, well, I like that idea, but I don't really feel it. But the foundation is laid for it to be that way, and I want it to be that way in the show. Because I want there to be representation of homoamorous bisexual women. I want them to be able to make it very clear that this isn't, like, you know, two women together are a lesbian couple, but this is not a couple of lesbians. Because one could be a lesbian couple without being a couple of lesbians. My wife and I are a lesbian couple. We are not a couple of lesbians, though. We are homoamorous bisexual women. And having that out there could break a number of stereotypes because it could show, no, no, this isn't a relationship where Rand is some kind of exception to the rule. Like, you know, these are lesbians, but they'll have sex with this one man because he was born on the slopes of Dragon Mount with the magical dragon penis, which is pure fantasy fuel for straight men and i am not anti-fantasy but it's a cliche fantasy and it's also problematic in that how many lesbians have heard you just haven't found the right man so fuck that fantasy people can find it on pornhub in more subgenres than you can shake a dick at so the showrunners would need to find a way to show no these women elaine and avienda are not lesbians they're bisexual women who love women and I feel like you could even do a simple foreshadowing, like, while well, Avienda is still carrying the spear, she has an Aiel man that she likes to bone down with on a regular basis, and he wants her to make him a bridal wreath. He's like, you know, yo, you're gonna be a wise one, and you have to give up the spear. Hint, hint. I'd really like it if you made me a bridal wreath, so she could tell him, look, this is fun. I like you. Only a woman will satisfy my heart. It's like, sorry. It's fun, but you're never going to be enough. You're dessert. I can't have nothing but dessert for the rest of my life. And that can help show that bisexual women don't all end up with men, or bisexuality isn't just a phase, and it can show another relationship model of queer ladies who occasionally enjoy male company. And then different characters can be for real lesbians to show healthy lesbian representation and I think Swan would be a great character for that. While I find her relationship with Gareth Bryn somewhat believable in the story, I don't think it's a very interesting relationship. And I can see her arc being one where she's a lesbian and she can't be involved with anyone while she's the Amarlin because of the power dynamics. But being stilled opens up the possibility for her to have a love story as well as everything else that happens in her life. If they did that tastefully, it could be really good. I'm not sure who would be a good love option for her. I don't want it to be Moraine. I don't find the relationship between her and Moraine to be something that's sustainable into their, you know, older adulthood. And I'm honestly glad that they cast someone relatively young for Tom so that Rosamund Pike and the actor who plays Tom can be eye-fucking each other the whole time. I've 
listened to a number of podcasts and there are first time readers who actually pick up on the chemistry between Tom and Moraine, but I sure as shit never did. And so I like the idea that they picked, you know, a, a hot Dutchman who they can have some chemistry there. And I think that Swan would be a great character to show real and healthy lesbian representation with some other character being a good romantic interest for her. And the only vision that I want Min to have regarding Rand's love life is that she sees that Rand will get Elaine and Avienda both pregnant. Perhaps not at the same time, though, but have a vision that he will found bloodlines with them. The Karakarn will father an ideal bloodline through Avienda, and he will father the next generation of Trakan children to succeed to the throne of Andor. But it would be really nice if Rand, Elaine, and Avienda are friends. I'd like them to have a really good flirt going on. I don't want it to be something where Min has this vision that you need to go bone down with these two ladies and get them preggers and then peace out. You know, I'd like them to actually have some kind of relationship already established to where it's more that Rand, Elaine, and Avienda fuck around for fun. Not because Min had a vision, because I hate anyone doing anything because of Min's visions. And then what I'd really like is for Rand and Min to organically fall in love later on. And I think that I want Egwene to be single, even though it seems cruel, because she's the one who dies, and the whole idea of you didn't get laid even once. And though I think that, honestly, we should have positive ace representation in the show, too. I think it's really important to have asexuality out there, not just a fringe thing. So ace people know that they're normal and they can feel comfortable talking about their sexuality and having an important character be ace is a good way to do that. I don't think that it should be a character who dies. Um, I considered for a moment that maybe Egwene should be asexual, but I think that having one of the characters who dies be ace sets a poor precedent. And I definitely think that they should have asexual representation in the show, but it should be a character who lives happily ever after um, so that it can be presented in the most positive way possible. And therefore, I think Egwene should be single. Or let's dump both Gowan and Fayil and just ship her and Perrin. That works too. If you take out the giggling and 99% of the discussion about Rand, the chapter New Friends and Old Enemies, and then the chapter Practice, so two chapters in the White Tower with 13 weeks between them, do a great job with limited text of granting us a greater understanding of both Min and Elaine and their personalities and motivations. So in a short time frame, RJ establishes an interesting group in the four women, particularly in the three friends, because at this point, Nynaeve is still the older, wiser one. So he establishes them before sending them to Falma and traumatizing them and fracturing them. With Min and Elaine, you have two people who have each faced very unique struggles, but neither of them have dealt with the kind of trauma that Egwene and Nynaeve know. I've always wondered if they witnessed Loghain's gentling, because everything that we've heard makes it sound like gentling or stilling is a very public event or a public trial, and I would think that something like that would be incredibly traumatic to watch. Since Elaine went to Tarvalin with the whole party that was bringing Loghain, it seems like it would be something that she would have been witness to, and that makes it one of those things that, similarly to Egwene going through Shatter Logoth, it's something that I really regret it doesn't get reflected on later by Elaine, because I'm guessing that she had to have borne witness to it, and so her memories and impressions of it would be very valuable to see, and not just for her personal take, but for the world building that witnessing gentling would have given us. Elaine is one of those characters that many people dislike. I'm actually quite fond of her. She's honestly one of my favorites, and there's a lot of reasons for that. RJ describes Egwene's first impression of her. It says, Egwene thought the girl was about her own age, but there was a dignity and self-possession about her that made her seem older. The plainly cut novice dress appeared somehow more on her. Elegant, that was it. Rand has a similar first impression of Elaine. When he falls into the garden and she drops out of the tree and he sees her clothes, it says, He could not begin to imagine who would choose to climb trees in clothes like that, but he was sure she had to be someone important. The way she was looking at him redoubled the impression. 
She did not seem in the least troubled at having a stranger tumble into her garden. There was a self-possession about her that made him think of Nynaeve or Moraine. So we're told that she's very calm and collected, and that her bearing gives her the strange mix of youthfulness and wisdom. And then Jordan gives us this interesting bit. Elaine's blue eyes took on a thoughtful expression. You were born with it, weren't you? Egwene nodded. Yes, I thought I felt it. So was I, born with it. Do not be disappointed if you did not know. You will learn to feel the ability in other women. I had the advantage of growing up around an Aes Sedai. Egwene wanted to ask about that. Who grows up with Aes Sedai? But Elaine went on. And also, do not be disappointed if it takes you some time before you can achieve anything. With the one power, I mean. Even the simplest thing takes a little time. Depending on how a person wants to take this, don't be disappointed if you didn't know could sound very condescending. Like, I know so much more than you, but don't feel bad. But I can totally imagine being in Elaine's shoes. Being a well-intentioned person with a strong sense of empathy, trying to anticipate potential fears someone might have but be afraid to admit, perhaps fears that you yourself had, and trying to preemptively assuage them. You're aware of your privilege, and you know that it's advantageous to grow up with an Aes Sedai, and so you own that privilege ahead of time. You care so much about someone's feelings, and you want them to like you, and you worry that you've already made yourself sound like a dick, and so you want them to know that they're okay, and no pressure, and you're sort of like you know, second-guessing yourself because you don't want to come across as overbearing or snooty or anything. And then Elaine even clarifies it when she's sort of like, you know, don't be disappointed if it takes you some time before you can achieve anything, w with the one power, I mean, so that Egwene wouldn't think she meant, don't worry if it takes you a long time to achieve anything whatsoever. And to give us a little more insight into Elaine's character, we get this encounter with Elida, which is interesting for a couple of reasons. For one thing, Elaine was probably very surprised to come across someone of equal talent and potential in Egwene. Everyone has been talking about how she will be the most powerful Aes Sedai in a thousand years. In Faldara, Swan tells Moraine that Elaine has more potential than she has ever seen, and how the Red Aja gained a whole bunch of status because Elida brought Elaine to Tarvalon. So the daughter heir, who has been treated as special all her life, is even more special. Then here comes this village girl who has just as much potential, but rather than feeling threatened or sulky or like she's not getting her due, Elaine is pleased, and she immediately wants Elida to know of her. Elida, Elaine said, this is Egwene. She was born with a seed in her too, and she has already had some lessons, so she is as far along as I am. Elida? The Aes Sedai's face was blank and unreadable. In Camelin, child, I am counselor to the queen, your mother, but this is the White Tower, and you a novice. Min made as if to go, but Elida stopped her with a sharp, Stay, girl, I would speak with you. I've known you all my life, Elida, Elaine said incredulously. You watched me grow up and made the gardens bloom in winter so I could play. Child, there you were the daughter heir. Here you are a novice. You must learn that. You will be great one day, but you must learn. Yes, I said I. Egwene was astounded. If someone had snubbed her so before others, she would have been in a fury. Now off with both of you. A gong began to toll, deep and sonorous, and Elida tilted her head. The sun stood halfway to its pinnacle. Hi, Elida said. You must hurry if you do not want further admonishment. And Elaine, see the mistress of novices in her study after your chores. A novice does not speak to Aes Sedai unless bidden to. Run, both of you. You will be late. Run. They ran, holding their skirts up. Egwene looked at Elaine. Elaine had two spots of color in her cheeks and a determined look on her face. I will be, I said I, Elaine said softly, but it sounded like a promise. The fact that Elaine is not in a fury about this makes her likable. She accepts Elida's rebuke. It's what she signed up for. It's a price for her ultimate goal, and she doesn't behave like she's entitled to better. R.J. sketches someone who is smart and oblivious at the same time, tone-deaf while trying to be sensitive, naive even as she's educated, and both mature and childish. Like, her most childish thing that you see is her reaction to Galad, who she can't fucking stand, and so she is so vehemently like, he is not my brother. 
And because I can't stand snitches, I get Elaine's sentiment with Galad. It says something basic about the quality of the person that someone is, if they are the type of person who will turn you in for things that are against the rules, but not morally wrong. And it's an issue, and I do not blame her for her feelings about Galad, that that kind of like, I abjure you because you are a fundamentally flawed person that you will throw me under the bus for your notion of righteousness. Fuck you. But at the same time, I always was under the impression that Galad was only a couple of years older than Gowan, so that he was maybe like four or five years older than Elaine. According to the Wheel of Time companion, he is ten years older than Elaine. And at that point, you're looking at someone who's 18 when Elaine is 8 and getting into mischief, or 16 when she's 6, or 20 when she's 10. And at that point, that person is less a narc and more just a drag. Like, rather than being the cool much older brother, he's just the lame ass. Because when you're a kid, you're putting someone Galad's age in a really uncomfortable position if you're expecting them to keep quiet when you're getting in trouble and doing the wrong thing. If they're really technically an adult at that point, it's like you cannot, when you're a kid, expect the adult to not go to the other older adults and be like, yo, this is going down. Expecting him to look the other way is kind of unreasonable. And I never really realized how much older that he was, and knowing that he's ten years older and not five years older, and that most of the time that she's super angry with him for being a giant narc, he was more or less an adult, he's... Just like your lame-ass uncle or something, he's a total drag, but you cannot feel that same sense of utter betrayal of this person is a fucking narc and a backstabber the way you can with someone who really is your peer. And so I feel like maybe her feelings toward Galad are less logical, and maybe because she is daughter heir, and because her rank and position entitle her to be obeyed by Galad and be obeyed by Gowan, maybe that makes it different for her, but... I just, I feel like Galad's in a tough spot because you cannot expect someone who is an adult to just be like, okay, well, I'll look the other way while you get into mischief because I don't want to be a narc, especially when the queen, your stepmom, can cut your head off. Min is a less complicated person than Elaine. She is relaxed and fun. She takes life as it comes. And there's a sense not just of a more common person, like, you know, she's a stable hand. She was raised by seamstresses. She has no pretensions, you know. She worked at serving tables. She grew up in the mines before her father died. She's not afraid to get dirty. And she's someone who is used to having minimal agency because of her gift. She did okay before Taviran came into her life, and before Moraine, probably at Whitebridge, sent a pigeon to Tarvalon saying, send gold to Master Fitch to rebuild the inn and fetch Min. Because Min's visions are useful to have to hand, and also, who knows if the Shadow learned of her visions if they could make use of them. The first bit of POV that we ever get for Min is very indicative of her character. Elida basically sends everybody off because she wants to talk to Min. It says, Min's shirt clung to her when she finally left the bridge, not sweat from the sun, but from the heat of Elida's questions. She looked over her shoulder to make sure the Aes Sedai was not following her, but Elida was nowhere in sight. How did Elida know that Moraine had summoned her? Min had been sure that was a secret known only to her, Moraine, and Shiriam. And all those questions about Rand. It had not been easy keeping a smooth face and a steady eye while telling an Aes Sedai to her face that she had never heard of him and knew nothing of him. What does she want with him? Like, what does Moraine want with him? What is he? So, obviously... Shirium being Black Aja, that information would be free game for Galena Kazvan, the highest of the Red Aja, to have, and at that point it would be passed on to Elida. There are no secrets at the point that the Black Aja has hold of it. But this bit of text shows that Min is very loyal, and Elida is no friend of hers. And however frustrated she might be with Moraine, because she's like, where the fuck is she? She wanted me to come to the tower. Here I am, and she's not here. Why the fuck am I here? You know, basically, I'm like standing here with my proverbial dick in my hand, waiting, wondering what the fuck am I supposed to be doing? But however frustrated she might be with Moraine, she's not about to help Elida. In the Great Hunt, Elaine gets to fill the position that Egwene did in the Eye of the World when it comes to a desire for adventure. 
kind of volunteering to be a soldier with the expectation that it's going to be awesome. When Leandrin lures Egwene and Nynaeve out of the tower, Elaine comes along for the fun of it. She's not going to let them go off and have an adventure without her. It says, Min and Elaine came bustling in, slamming the door behind them. Are you really going? Min asked, and Elaine gestured toward the tiny hole in the wall above Egwene's bed, saying, We listened from my room. We heard everything. Egwene exchanged glances with Nynaeve, wondering how much they had overheard, and saw the same concern on Nynaeve's face. If they manage to cipher out about Rand, you have to keep this to yourselves, Nynaeve cautioned them. I suppose Leandrin has arranged permission from Shirium for us to go, but even if she hasn't, even if they start searching the tower from top to bottom for us tomorrow, you mustn't say a word. Keep it to myself, Min said. No fear on that. I'm going with you. All I do all day is try to explain to one brown sister or another something I don't understand myself. I can't even go for a walk without the Amarlin herself popping out and asking me to read whoever we see. When that woman asks you to do something, there doesn't seem to be any way out of it. I must have read half the White Tower for her, but she always wants another demonstration. All I needed was an excuse to leave, and this is it. Her face wore a look of determination that allowed no argument. Equaine wondered why Min was so determined to go with them rather than simply leaving on her own, but before she had time to do more than wonder, Elaine said, I'm going to... Elaine, Nynaeve said gently, Egwene and I are the boy's kith from Emmons Field. You were the daughter of Andor. If you disappear from the White Tower, White, it, it could start a war. Mother wouldn't start a war with Tarval, and if they dried and salted me, which they may be trying to do. If you three can go off and have an adventure, you needn't think I'm going to stay here and wash dishes and scrub floors and have some accepted berating me because I didn't make the fire the exact shade of blue she wanted. Gowan will die from envy when he finds out. And then she says something stupid about, I might be able to pick Rand up if you leave him lying about loose, and... Yeah, anyway. Pff. Oh, please smile, Egwene. I know he's yours. I just feel... She hesitated, searching for the word free. I've never had an adventure. I'll bet we won't either of us cry ourselves to sleep on an adventure, and if we do, we will make sure the Gleeman leave that part out. This is foolishness, Nynaeve said. We are going to Toman Head. You've heard the news and the rumors. It will be dangerous. You must stay here. I heard what Leandrin Sedai said about the, the Black Aja, too. Elaine's voice dropped almost to a whisper at that name. How safe will I be here if they are here? If Mother even suspected the Black Aja really existed, she would pitch me into the middle of a battle to get me away from them. But Elaine... There is only one way for you to stop me coming. That is to tell the mistress of novices. We will make a pretty picture, all three of us lined up in her study. All four of us. I don't think Min would escape from something like this. So since you are not going to tell Shiriam Sadai, I am coming too. Niney threw up her hands. Perhaps you can say something to convince her, she told Min. Min had been leaning against the door, squinting at Elaine, and now she shook her head. I think she has to come as much as the rest of you. The rest of us. I can see the danger around all of you more clearly now. Not clearly enough to make it out, but I think it has something to do with you deciding to go. That's why it is clearer, because it is more certain. That's no reason for her to come, Nynaeve said, but Min shook her head again. She is linked to, to those boys as much as you or Egwene or me. She's part of it, Nynaeve, whatever it is. Part of the pattern, I suppose, an Aes Sedai would say. Elaine seemed taken aback and interested, too. I am? What part, Min? I can't see it clearly. Min looked at the floor. Sometimes I wish I couldn't read people at all. Most people aren't satisfied with what I see anyway. If we are all going, Nynaeve said, then we had best be about making plans. However much she might argue beforehand, once a course of action had been decided, Nynaeve always went right to the practicalities, what they had to take with them and how cold it would be by the time they reached Tome and Head, and how they could get their horses from the stables without being stopped. Listening to her, Egwene could not help wondering what the danger was that Min saw for them, and what danger threatened Rand. She knew of only one danger that could threaten him, and it made her cold to think of it. Hold on, Rand. Hold on, you wool-headed idiot. I'll help you somehow. Min's choice to go with them is more mature. She feels trapped in the tower doing something useless. She's not as trapped as she'll be in eight or nine months when Swan is more or less holding her prisoner as Elmandreda and it takes a lightest coup to free her. Right now, she's just over it. She's over being in the tower. And her vision is also probably telling her to go, which is a lot less interesting than Elaine's naive adventure-seeking. 
It says here as they're trying to get out of the tower, and then they see an Aes Sedai, and they have to pretend that they're petitioners. My heart may burst before we reach the stables, Elaine murmured. Is this what an adventure is like all the time, Egwene? Your heart and your mouth and your stomach and your feet? I suppose it is, Egwene said slowly. She found it hard to think that there had been a time when she had been eager to have an adventure, to do something dangerous and exciting like the people in the stories. Now she thought the exciting part was what you remembered when you looked back, and the stories left out a good deal of unpleasantness. She told Elaine as much. Still, the daughter heir said firmly, I have never had any real excitement before, and never likely to, as long as mother has any say in it, was she willing till I take the throne myself. And of course this just whets Elaine's appetite for adventure. She really is a green sister at heart, and it will eventually kind of make her struggle and put her at odds with her duty to the people as the queen. Over three chapters, the earlier one called Old Friends and New Enemies, and then these two, 13 weeks later, Practice and Flight from the White Tower, RJ sketches the relationships between the four women. And it almost feels like a long-established thing. He does a really good job in a relatively short amount of time with not a ton of text. So much of the story is devoted to Rand, and it's almost like he just gives us an outline and a little bit of filler to paint the White Tower, and then he shifts the girls to Tome and Head. He's moving all of the pieces to Tome and Head. He moved Jacob Carradin to Tome and Head, and moved Jeffrey Bornhold and the White Cloak Legion over there. He got Bile Doman over there, and then he's got Rand, the Shinerins, and Matt and Perrin, Loyal and Varen over there, and now the girls are the last piece that he's got to get over there. And so since he's been so Rand-focused, he's like, okay, I'll sketch this little bit of the White Tower. And then he takes this time, and it's not very much, but even so, he manages to give a really decent description of the relationship between these friends, where you have these three younger women, and Elaine, Egwene, and Min, and then Nynaeve being kind of the older, wiser one. And then they travel through the ways to Tome and Head, and they come out the other side, and Leandrin fucks them over and passes them off to the Shanchen. Suroth's soldier Elbar seizes both Min and Elaine, and because Min stabs him in the hand, she cuts the hand that's holding Elaine, Elaine is able to get free before he knocks Min down. And Nynaeve calls a storm up that fucking blows everybody around, and so she is able to gallop away, and Egwene gets collared, and she and Min are prisoners and are taken to Falma. And it only just occurred to me in doing this episode... Because I see Egwene as Rand's counterpart. She is the flame to his fang, and Egwene's time as Demani is her version of being in the box. And Min was there with Rand while he was stuffed into the box and tortured, and she was also with Egwene during her time in the box. Min is there for both of them during that difficult period. And her friendship with Egwene is never really quite the same after, simply because at the very end, Egwene is pulled by Rand's severe and tugging, and she comes upon him, and Min is in bed trying to keep him warm. And when Egwene and her practicality is like, you know he's not safe for us, right? You know what he is? He's a male channeler, and that's not safe. And Min's like, speak for yourself. You tossed him aside for the White Tower. So Min's a bitch about it. And it isn't necessary. It's so much easier just to sort of be like, you can't make that decision for me. You know, it's one thing if it's a deal breaker for you. And there's nothing wrong with it being a deal breaker for Egwene. If she wants a rand, she wants Emmons Field rand with a little bit more adventure and sophistication. She does not want the person that rand will become once channeling changes him. She knows the Rand from before too well, and the divergence of what channeling will do is disturbing. People like Min and Elaine don't know Rand from before, and so that is not there to trouble them the way that it is for Egwene. But she and Min are never really the same after, and they don't see each other again until the very end, when the last battle is actually going on. But despite spending an unfortunate amount of time discussing Rand with some horribly cringy dialogue, these chapters give us a good handle on the characters of Elaine and Min and get all of the characters in position to set up the fuckery that will be the showdown in Falma. And it's done pretty well. 
I really do like both of these characters. I especially like Elaine. There's just something endearing about Elaine's combination of cluelessness and earnestness, intelligence, knowledge, and dumbassery all together. And this book will begin her and Nynaeve's bromance that continues throughout the series. And the Nynaeve-Elaine bromance is one of my favorite relationships in the entire story. I think what I appreciate best, having done this episode, is that I was able to go through these chapters, and despite the fact that the giggling and the talking all about Rand and everything making me want to pound nails into my eyes, I was able to find so much that was worthwhile, because Jordan, however untalented he is when it comes to giggling girls talking about boys, he's so good with minimal words in a small scene sketching people and laying a foundation it's an incredible strength and i am very hopeful that the show will be able to make up for where he lacks strength and i'm looking forward to some good representation and some artfully plotted relationships judicious use of men's visions and however they choose to go with the three girls one dragon do it in a way that isn't so rand centric I'm excited to see what they do. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Podcast of the Dragon. This one has shown me once again how wonderful the Wheel of Time is, and even where things are annoying or they slow or bog me down, I find so much that's worthwhile. It was a really valuable episode. I got a whole bunch out of it, and it was great. You can find me on Twitter at Warder Gray. That's Gray with an E. All of my links are down in the show notes. So there's a link for my email, for my Discord. There's a link for the Watt Trivia Games Discord, which I highly recommend you checking out. There's a whole bunch of fun stuff in that community. If you want to play games and hang out with cool people, check out the Watt Phantom and Calendar. Uh, I would really appreciate it if you could rate and review my show. That would really help me out. I'm trying to expose myself to more people. That came out really wrong, but uh, I want more listeners. Uh, if you could tell a friend about me, that would be amazing. I recently recorded an episode with Rob from Malkir Talks, and we talked about Black Aja, so when that drops, I will post a link to it, which will be awesome. My music is by Kevin McLeod. I'm the Grey Warder. And if I were Elaine, and I was assigned to show Egwene the ropes at Magic Academy, I'd probably say something that made me sound like a condescending asshole, too. Because that's how I roll.